are not yet known. The citizens of Pakistan are in need. We must support them with both our thoughts and prayers and our aid and assistance. While Pakistan has been one of the hardest hit this year, they are not alone. From Moscow to Music City, USA, 2010 has seen a surge in weather extremes. Uh, we welcome you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, and we thank you so much for uh, joining us. So I have just begun my opening statement. Uh, we'll recognize uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner, and then uh, we will turn to you for your uh, remarks. Um, uh, so the, uh, while, uh, while Pakistan has been one of the hardest hits, there are other parts of the world that have been hit as well. Russia experienced both the worst heat wave and one of the worst droughts on record. In China, torrential rains and flooding have claimed more than 2,000 lives this year. In India, blistering heat killed dozens of people, and just this week, two million were left homeless from flooding. Here at home, record-breaking temperatures scorched the east and disastrous flooding inundated Tennessee, Iowa, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. In my home state of Massachusetts, we had two 50-year storms in two weeks. This all comes in a year that so far is tied for the hottest on record and comes on the heels of the hottest decade on record. Meanwhile, concentrations of heat-trapping pollution continue to rise in our atmosphere, committing us to further warming in the decades ahead. Just as smoking increases your chance of lung cancer, heat-trapping pollution in the atmosphere increases the odds of weather disasters like we are experiencing this year. The more heat-trapping pollution, the higher the risk for extreme weather. In the United States, we are already breaking high temperature records, twice as often as low temperature records, and the amount of rain falling in heavy downpours has increased substantially in recent decades. Last year, the House of Representatives came together building a plan to address the climate crisis and end our dependence on foreign oil. The Waxman-Markey bill would create millions of new domestic jobs and make the United States the leader in addressing the international impacts of climate change. The flooding disaster in Pakistan is a painful warning that we must act with urgency. Today, our distinguished guests will help us to understand the devastating impacts of extreme weather, the influence of climate change, and the increased risks we will all face uh, as we continue to alter our atmosphere. Uh, that completes the Chair's opening statement. I now turn to recognize the ranking member, mm -hmm. the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stensenbrenner, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to begin by reading an excerpt from Time magazine. Quote, Across eastern India and Pakistan, monsoon rains swept in mighty torrents between the Himalayas and the sea. At the heart of the populous Ganges Valley, 10,000 villages crumbled and vanished, and farmers shared tree trunks with cobras in the worst floods since 1871. In the coastal state of Orissa, eight rivers thundered simultaneously into spate, killing at least 150, inundating 3,500 square miles of drought-seared cropland. The state's 138 legislators dropped everything and rushed homeward to find out their family's fate. This excerpt was published in 1955. The flooding in Pakistan is a tragedy, and I offer my sincere apologies and hopes of a speedy recovery. But we're not here to talk about how Pakistan can recover from the flood a topic I would be interested in discussing. This is about how to tie this natural disaster to the Democrats' environmental agenda, which will do nothing to stop the monsoon rains in Pakistan. There is no evidence of a direct link between climate change and these floods. Listen carefully, as the words may and could are often used as qualifiers. IPPC chief, Ark Gay Pachori said it was, quote, scientifically incorrect, unquote, to link this flood to the theory of man-made climate change. He did add, however, that these types of floods may become more frequent. 
Last month, a paper published by the American Meteorological Society attributed the rise in damage and losses from extreme weather not to climate change, but to increased development in hazardous areas. Pakistan's floods are a natural disaster of epic proportions, and its people deserve aid and compassion, which I support. But we're not here to talk about that. This briefing is about raising energy taxes on Americans in an effort to advance the Democrats' policy of cap and tax, otherwise known as the Waxman-Markey Bill. And you won't hear the words may and could when I say this agenda will hurt America's economy. It's shameful that the Democrats are putting politics before people and are using this tragedy as a platform for grandstanding. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. I thank the, uh, the gentleman uh, so much. Um, I have a piece of legislation that has just been called up on the House floor that will take 15 minutes. Is it possible that you could uh, continue the briefing? We are under, uh, under, excuse me. Uh, absolutely. You know, this might be a token of things to come. <laughs> um, uh, there is severe, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, severe weather changes are uh, 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 changing the climate. I don't think the political climate is going to change quite that drastically uh, in the next six weeks, but, you know. Okay. But, um, uh, I would appreciate it, and sure. I will, and I will return you. presently. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our first participant today is Pakistan's ambassador to the United States, Hussein Haqqani. Ambassador Haqqani previously served as an advisor and spokesman to Prime Ministers Jatoy, Sharif, and Bhutto. He served as Pakistan's ambassador to Sri Lanka. We welcome you, Mr. Ambassador, and please begin when you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me Could you pull the mic a little bit closer? I know it's on, but let me just begin Thank by you. Let, yeah, let me just begin by saying that there's a short video clip that we would show before I make my comments. These are difficult times for Pakistan, where the floods have unleashed its ferocity across its land, engulfing huge masses of humanity, swallowing up.
humanity calling global response for relief and rehabilitation of flood victims in pakistan thank you uh, that was just a video clip of the, uh, showing the scale and intensity of the recent floods in pakistan and the destruction that they have caused <coughs> these floods are the result of the worst monsoon rains uh, in pakistan's history uh, before i go on I will just uh, make a short comment on the exchange between the chairman and the honorable ranking member uh, as your guest and as ambassador of Pakistan to the United States. There are two subjects I am not going to try and address. Uh, one is the potential political climate change, uh, which I am sure both of you will agree will be purely man-made, uh, <laughs> if it occurs. Uh, the second, I am not going to get into the scientific and technical issues uh, because that is best dealt with uh, by uh, 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 the scientific community and not by uh, diplomats or politicians. Uh, the statistics relating to uh, this flood are staggering. Uh, by now, 21 million people have been affected. That is more people uh, than were affected by the tsunami, the 2005 Northern Pakistan earthquake and the Haiti earthquake put together. This figure includes 6 million children and 800,000 pregnant women. Uh, by now, and this uh, video was made about two, three weeks ago, uh, 2,000 lives have been lost. The last great floods recorded uh, in the Indus Basin were in 1929. Uh, this year's floods uh, have resulted in water dis discharges at certain points six times more uh, than the 1929 recorded water discharges in the rivers. At peak flood, more than 20% of Pakistan's territory an area the size of Italy was underwater. 70% uh, of the infrastructure in the flood affected areas has been damaged or destroyed. This includes roads, rails, bridges, power lines, and grid stations. Uh, just to give you an idea, in the picturesque Swat Valley, which Pakistan's military uh, freed from terrorists last year, uh, there were 43 bridges spanning the different rivers and streams. All 43 have been destroyed. Uh, the oldest of these was built in 1928, the uh, newest built in 2008. So that's 80 years of human construction activity washed away uh, by a single flood. Uh, nearly 2 million homes and 8,000 schools have been damaged or destroyed throughout Pakistan. 17 million acres out of 43 million acres of Pakistan's arable land were inundated. There were crops standing in 9 million acres. We have lost the present crop, and the poor farmers are not likely to be able to plant the next one as well. Uh, they have also, uh, uh, the ground is too soggy, and the seeds have been washed away or rendered useless due to the rains. We are particularly grateful to the United States of America, who were, uh, which was the first country with the most assistance in this difficult time. Uh, it still remains the single largest donor uh, for flood relief in Pakistan. And the United States has also provided 36 helicopters manned by US Marines uh, who are helping rescue those stranded in, in inaccessible areas. The World Bank and the Asian Development Bank are currently carrying out, carrying out a detailed assessment of Pakistan's needs and the damage done to the country's infrastructure and economy. Uh, the loss, uh, both in terms of uh, 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 relief and rehabilitation, uh, of the infrastructure is estimated to be around $43 billion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it is ironical that this deluge was preceded in Pakistan by a steadily worsening water situation in the country. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has identified Pakistan as likely to be among the hardest hit by climate change and global warming. And as I said earlier, I have no intention of getting into the middle of the political debates in the United States on the causes of climate change and global warming. I'll leave that to the scientists. But I would point out that Pakistan has always been a hot country with summer temperatures touching 50 degrees centigrade or 122 Fahrenheit in some parts of the country during summers. Pakistan is also one of the world's most arid countries. Over 75% of it receives rainfall less than 250 millimeters annually, and 20% receives less than 125 millimeters of rain annually. The population and economy 
are heavily dependent on an annual influx into the Indus River system of about 154 million acre feet of water derived from snow and glacier melt and the monsoons. Unfortunately, the country is getting hotter. The summers are lengthening and winters shrinking and becoming milder. Monsoons, the main source of water in our rivers, are becoming totally unpredictable. For example, this year, some parts of our northwestern Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province received 10 years of rainfall in one week. In a presentation prepared by our Ministry for Water and Power before the floods, it was prophetically said that climate change and global warming were likely to cause water-related extreme events, such as droughts, floods, cloud bursts, cyclones, seawater rise, salt water intrusion, glacier melt and avalanches, new crop and animal diseases, and monsoonic pattern change. This last phenomenon of monsoonic pattern change was on awesome display in Pakistan this year. Mr. Chairman, while the debate about climate change and global warming continues in the world, we in Pakistan are living through this change. We think the present rains and the resultant floods in Pakistan are linked to changing climate patterns in our region, which have been observed by scientists. Uh, and of course, while they may disagree about their causes, they cannot disagree about the consequences. We understand that the Earth's climate is never static and continues to change. However, there is definitely an element of human activity accelerating this process of change. Uh, our scientists in Pakistan believe that greenhouse gases emitted by factories, motor vehicles, and even farm animals across the world are contributing to rising global temperatures. Um, among other factors that we uh, have noticed uh, is human activity. Uh, in the glaciers, uh, the Siachen Glacier, uh, which is a heavily militarized area between India and Pakistan, despite the uh, uh, efforts by Pakistan to try and get it demilitarized, uh, certainly is, uh, is uh, facing human activity that it hasn't uh, ever before. Pakistan's own carbon footprint is minuscule compared to the developed countries. In fact, Pakistan is a negative carbon emitter, meaning that its emissions are even less than what it is allowed to emit. And it is bearing the burden of profligate use of Earth's natural resources by others. For a developing country beset by many problems, we have taken some important steps towards protecting our environment. We have a full-fledged ministry for uh, environmental protection, and we have an effective environmental protection agency. We are working on a national sustainable development strategy to deal with climate change and global warming. We have national policies on drinking water, forestation, management of rangeland, clean air, energy conservation. But the fact remains that we are but a small part of the global village. Uh, in ev a, a, as in everything else, we are hampered by lack of resources in the proper implementation of these policies. And these recent floods have certainly added to our resource constraints. Thank you very much for affording me an opportunity to present to you uh, certain facts from Pakistan. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And, you know, let me say that uh, I think your comments about the response of the United States you know, are very heartwarming. You know, Americans are compassionate people. We are a compassionate country. And, uh, this is obviously a, a tragedy of uh, inestimable proportions. Um, of course, whenever tragedy like this happens, the first thing that has to be done is to provide shelter, food, clothing, and medicine uh, to the people who are displaced, whether it's by a flood or an earthquake or some other type of natural disaster. Uh, that's kind of phase one. But the job really is not done uh, uh, until uh, the actual rebuilding of the devastated people's lives take place. And that will be several more phases, uh, hopefully fewer rather than more, uh, more phases. And uh, I'm sure that American aid and American technical assistance um, uh, will be able to help the people of Pakistan put their lives together after this tragedy and after uh, the preservation of lives and the prevention of disease take place. So 
Um, I would hope as time goes on, you would advise the committee and members of Congress exactly how the priorities will uh, uh, take place and uh, what the, the following steps will be because when a fifth of anybody's country is underwater at one time, uh, it's something that we in the United States, which has got a lot bigger area, uh, uh, you know, can't fathom. You know, we do have floods along our great rivers upon occasion uh, uh, as well, but uh, uh, certainly the, not the same percentage of uh, our population is displaced when the flood takes place. So thank you. And, you know, I can say that personally my thoughts and prayers are with the people of Pakistan and uh, this uh, uh, tragic moment and will continue to be so uh, because we don't want to see anybody uh, uh, not be able to recover from this because the whole world is hurt uh, if the Pakistani people who have been displaced can't uh, recover from it. So thank you for coming today and thank you for the video as well. Our second participant today is Dr. Michael Oppenheimer who is a professor of geoscientists and international affairs at Princeton University. He is a longtime participant in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and is serving as the coordinating lead author on the upcoming fifth assessment report uh, and on a special report on extreme events and disasters. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Oppenheimer, and please begin when you're ready. frequency and geographic extent of some types of extreme events and is expected to do so increasingly in the future. I point to, uh, well, there's a table which should have been shown up there now, perhaps it will be, which indicates, uh, this is from IPCC's fourth assessment report, and indicates seven types of weather extremes uh, when it appears. And um, uh, if you could just suspend yeah, a sure. minute while well, we get the video up on the screen, and I think it would help us understand your testimony better. Or it's It'll against the wall back there. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this table indicates seven types of weather extremes down on the uh, left-hand column. And I don't expect you to look at the table now in detail. You can do so afterwards. But the point is it indicates whether these um, extreme events, number one, whether a trend occurred in them during the 20th century. Uh, that is, for instance, whether we got more heat waves. Number two, whether the likelihood of whether this trend was likely or not related to the buildup of greenhouse gases, that's the, the third column and the fourth column, is the likelihood that this trend would continue in each case in the future. And you notice that the words that are used are very specific, very likely, more likely than not, likely, and these have specific numerical meanings in the report. For instance, more likely than not means a greater than a 50 percent chance. And uh, so that we are, we try to be more specific than just saying should and may, as uh, you pointed out a few moments ago, we, we do our best. Um, the, the main point of this is that you, we can be rather specific about some sorts of events, whether they've occurred, in, whether there's a trend in them, whether humans are responsible for the trend, and what's likely to happen in the future. Now, extreme events have received uh, prominence in the news, as we've heard this morning, include the, including the events in Pakistan. And I'd like to uh, uh, emphasize the following points with respect to the relationship of this table and IPC's findings to such events. First of all, you have to understand, events are like pixels on a, on a picture or on a computer screen. You really don't know very much about individual details. The whole picture itself is climate. So as has been said many times, no individual heat wave storm or other short-term weather phenomena can be uniquely tied to a, a cause and effect, in a cause and effect way to the buildup of the greenhouse gases. We simply cannot do it. Nevertheless, increased heat trapping uh, due to the buildup of the greenhouse gases does translate into, for instance, a better than even chance that we're loading the dice in favor of more such events like more, more frequent heat waves and uh, heavier precipitation events. And regardless of whether 
of whether we can make a specific statement about the cause and effect, Mr. Chairman, uh, these sorts of events provide an analog for the sort of climate that we're facing in the future. In particular, heat waves and heavy precipitation events are very likely to further increase in the future, according to the IPCC's analysis. The higher our emissions, the more likely our occurrences of these sorts of extremes. And I want to say that what the IPCC has to say about the events in Pakistan is that we can't make an assertion about any trend to date resulting uh, in the uh, intensity of the monsoon, but it is expected that if the greenhouse gases continue to build up, the, the intensity of these of monsoon events will increase in the future in that part of Asia. Fourth, my fourth point is that the assignment of cause for damaging outcomes of such extremes, and here I mean damaging outcomes like wildfires or increased human mortality in, um, in heat waves, is a very difficult uh, and complex matter to accomplish. But absent a vast improvement in our adaptation strategies aimed at addressing the risks entailed in the increasing frequencies of such climate extremes like wildfires and heat waves and major flooding events, we should expect more of these sorts of impacts in the future. That is, there are certain things we can do to defend ourselves against extreme floods by, for instance, managing fresh water better, taking people out of harm's way, but our experiences will never do that perfectly, so the increase in extremes is likely, in my view, to be a, a, uh, accompanied by an in increase in damage to humans and society. Such increases in extremes may well interact with each other, further exacerbating the consequences. For example, sea level is projected to rise by amounts ranging from at least eight inches to, according to some recent analyses, more than three feet. At the same time, that's a, a global average over the century, at the same time, intense hurricane activity is expected to increase, although there's argument about whether it already has. The combination of stronger storms plus a higher sea would likely create unprecedented flooding, much more so than from either uh, uh, increased uh, storminess or higher sea level separately. Uh, by the way, I want to point out that these sorts of findings cannot be generalized to all extreme events. There is as yet, for instance, no evidence uh, that, or there is insufficient evidence to make a statement on, for instance, whether there have been changes or trends in tornadoes or the future of tornadoes. Finally, while extreme events are generally a physical phenomena, circumstances where such events translate into disasters, like Hurricane Katrina or the Great European Heat Wave of 2003 or the Pakistan floods, depend in large measure on individual and societal anticipation, planning, and response capacity and implementation of that capacity. In other words, disaster is partly a social phenomenon. In both the episodes above, Katrina and the 2003 heat wave, where, by the way, upwards of 40,000 people perished, the toll was much higher than was imagined possible before the events. Unfortunately, if history is a guide, such situations may become e ever more common, assuming the greenhouse gases continue to build up. Even as we learn to cope better with certain extreme events, the climate may change faster than we learn about it and faster than our ability to impl implement what we have learned. The only remedy for such a situation is to slow the emissions of the greenhouse gases. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, our third participant is Dr. Thomas Peterson, Chief Scientist at NOAA's National Climate Data Center in Asheville, North Carolina, lead author in IPCC's fourth assessment report, and served as co-chair and co-editor-in-chief of the 2009 report, Global Climate Change Impacts in the United States. Currently, he is president of the United Nations World Meteorological Organization's Commission for Climatology. We welcome you, Dr. Peterson. Please begin when you are ready. Thank you, uh, distinguished member of the Select Committee. Um, it's important to have, have an opportunity to talk to you about extremes, which has been a focus not only of my work, but the work of many other people around the country and around the world, because extremes are really important. How extremes are changing is really going to be how climate change is experienced, that we can see a slight change in the mean, but it's the number of heat waves and the number of uh, really extreme events that'll, that'll impact us, and we're seeing that in both human systems and in natural systems as well. Scientists have long projected that we were going to be seeing a change in, in extremes, and we're now able to document some of those changes. Ten years ago, our knowledge on extremes was primarily 
limited to the United States and a few countries where we have very good data exchange relationships, such as Canada, Russia, China, and Australia. But over the last decade, we've had a whole series of workshops coordinated through the World Meteorological Organizations that have helped build in some of that, the rest of the world. I'll give you one example. In 2005, we had a workshop in Pune, India, that was funded by the, the U.S. Department of State and uh, who provided the, the funding to NOAA to hold the workshop. And we brought together scientists from Kazakhstan and Mongolia down to Sri Lanka, and they brought their data with them. And under the tutelage of world-recognized experts, we helped them learn how to process their data and to calculate a suite of indices of extremes to, from this region. And because we're using a globally coordinated series of, of indices, that all the results of all the different workshops could fit together seamlessly. And I'm told by colleagues in, in India that this was the first time in anyone's memory that Pakistani climatologists had participated in a meeting in India and that some of this collaboration has been continuing since then. So now that we've put together all the information, we're beginning to see what's, what's showing up primarily over the last half century because that's the period when we have data for most of the world, digital daily data. And what we're seeing is that warm extremes have been increasing more hot days and warm nights. We've seen a decrease in cold extremes. Cold extremes still happen, as we've seen you know, in this part of the country last winter. But the number of, of cold days have been decreasing, and the number of cold nights has definitely been decreasing. And these temperature trends have been very widespread around the world. For precipitation, we're seeing the strongest signal we're seeing is in increases in heavy precipitation events. So average around the world, the number of days with heavy precipitation has been increasing, and, and uh, the amount of precipitation, the percent of precipitation falling during these heavy days has been increasing. And we've seen this in the U.S. as well. For example, most notable is in the Northeast, where we've had a 67 percent increasing amount of precipitation falling from very heavy events over the last 50 years. And these change makes physical sense. We understand why they're occurring. If you increase the global mean temperature, you're going to increase and shift the distribution towards the warming sites. You're going to increase the number of, of warm extremes and decrease the number of cold extremes. And when it comes to precipitation, we also understand that this change because warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor. That's why clothes dryers are, um, heat the air so that the air can evaporate more water and hold more, more water vapor in it and take it away from the clothes. So similarly, when you have, have um, warmer atmosphere moving over warm ocean, you're getting more evaporation. And then when something does trigger the rainfall, such as a passage of a, of a cold front, we then have the potential for much heavier precipitation coming from the, that event because we have more ap moisture in the atmosphere. Thank you. Warner, I think you're up next. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blumenauer. My name is Michael Weiner, and I'm a staff scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California. My current research focuses on the detection and attribution of observed climate change, as well as the projection of future climate change. I'm particularly interested in our topic today, as future climate change is likely to be most vividly experienced through changes in extreme weather events. Can I have the lights on, actually? Um, I don't think we need the slides. I can't see it otherwise. Um, I've been privileged to be a member of the lead author teams of recent federal reports, uh, weather and climate extremes in a changing climate and global climate change impacts in the United States. I've also been selected to be a lead author um, for the upcoming fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I should make clear that the statements I make today are my own and may not represent the policies or position of the United States Department of Energy, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory of the University of California. And I thank you for the opportunity to express my views. The fourth assessment report of the IPCC states that the warming of the world's climate is unequivocal. Mm -hmm. Future warming is virtually certain if greenhouse gas and other man-made pollutants continue to increase at present rates in the atmosphere. The consequences of this will likely be most readily discernible in changes to extreme weather events. I would like to begin by saying a few words about climate change projections as they are often misunderstood. Credible projections of anything take into account all available information. In our case, this consists of the observed climate change, insights based on physical understanding of the climate system, computer models of the Earth's climate system, and assumptions about the future composition of the atmosphere. Expert judgment must then be called upon to synthesize this information into credible projections of the future climate. The computer modeling part of this process is often called into question by those who don't understand. 
Climate models are indeed far from perfect representations of reality. However, they do contain meaningful information. Expert judgment is used to extract it. As unwise as it is to have a blind faith in climate models, it is equally ill-advised to reject them entirely. My written testimony contains examples of how I expect future extreme weather events to change if greenhouse gas fo concentrations follow a business as usual scenario. I'll briefly summarize these expectations. As it is perhaps obvious that as the climate warms, heat waves will become more common. In fact, projections are that future heat waves will be severe for the United States. Extreme heat waves that would be considered rare today will become commonplace. The intensity of future rare heat waves is projected to be unprecedented, with temperatures higher than has ever been seen. I expect that daily te high temperature records will continue to be broken at high rates across the United States and much of the world for the foreseeable future. What may not be so obvious is that the future is very likely to be one where both floods and droughts are more severe than in the present. There are good physical reasons why this seeming contradiction must be so, and the climate models reflect them. Intense precipitation events are projected to increase in the United States simply because warmer air can hold more water, as Thomas said. Drought, as measured by the amount of soil, moisture in the soil, is projected to become the normal condition over the continental United States because of large evaporation increases due to warmer temperatures. The effects on glo of global warming on hurricanes and tropical cyclones are under intense scrutiny by many scientists, and much remains to be learned in this exciting field. A consensus view has emerged that intense hurricanes will become more frequent and more severe in a warmer world as dictated by simple energy considerations. The substantial federal investment in high performance computing is fostering a rapid development in the study of hurricanes by enabling the finely resolved calculations necessary to simulate these storms. Finally, I find that these projected future changes to extreme weather and climate in a warmer world to be sobering. The costs and impacts of even small increases in the severity of these phenomena can be large both to our nation as well as to other countries such as Pakistan. These projections can give policy and decision makers an early warning as to what might be, but such a future is not inevitable. Although such, some changes in extreme weather are already committed to, the ultimate size of these changes depends on the amount, amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted into the atmosphere. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, let me turn to you, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, I think it's very important. Talk to us a little bit about the vulnerability of Pakistan. Not only is the, the weather warming, but we see these dramatically increased amounts of precipitation that can have devastating uh, impacts. Uh, can you expand a little bit <coughs> in terms of uh, what the impact has been on Pakistan and what you project going forward could be the impact on your country uh, if, uh, uh, if these weather patterns continue in your region of the world. Um, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Oppenheimer pointed out that uh, uh, the impact of, uh, of these changes is very much connected to uh, social conditions and the circumstances and the preparedness of a society to deal with them. And Pakistan, of course, is a society uh, which is not completely prepared uh, for these uh, uh, significant uh, climate change uh, impacts uh, such as these floods. And we've seen that already. M a, a country with uh, uh, the, the mean age of Pakistan is 18, which means half of our population is below the age of 18, uh, a very young population. That's 90 million young people. Um, with 20 percent of the, uh, or one-fifth of the country underwater, uh, as a result of these floods, if we were to have a similar situation back to back uh, within the next couple of years, our ability to withstand all of that will be uh, uh, um, uh, at best very, very limited. Um, and uh, our impact, uh, you know, being a, a negative carbon emitter in the sense that uh, 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 we are uh, uh, in terms of, uh, we, we are actually facing the consequences of the actions of others, really because we are not uh, contributing to uh, the emission of uh, uh, greenhouse gases at the same level as uh, other nations of the world. And uh, in terms of the human devastation that it would cause, it's, it's all very visible. Um, 
uh, we uh, have been lo we've, we've lost crops this year and we will lose probably the next crop uh, we have the we've lost the uh, 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 the standing crop and the coming crop and uh, and that will severely impair our ability uh, to feed our own population um, in 2006 mm. an expert panel convened by the Center for Naval Analysis here in the United States concluded that climate change is a threat multiplier for instability in certain regions of the world and it will add tensions even in stable regions. Earlier this year, the Pentagon's Quadrennial Defense Review and the annual threat assessment highlighted climate change as a destabilizing agent and a serious threat to global security. Given the impacts of this flood so far, what are the resulting security concerns for Pakistan that you see now, and what are the future threats with continued climate change to the security of Pakistan? Just focusing on the impact of these floods, I would say uh, there are four very visible uh, impacts on our security situation. Number one, having 20 million people who are affected in terms of displacement or, or, or not having uh, essential commodities accessible or having their life totally disrupted, uh, you have a, a, a potential for uh, uh, unrest. Uh, which has security implications. It is pos second, there is the prospect and possibility of uh, insurgent and extremist groups taking advantage of the uh, uh, circumstances. Uh, the third is that uh, in flood relief we have seen, we have had to um, divert uh, our uh, security forces towards providing immediate flood relief. I mean, we can't, a nation like Pakistan, our entire a fleet of helicopters is just 51 helicopters, mm -hmm. and when you had uh, uh, one fifth of the country underwater and 20 percent of the population affected, um, if you uh, put even all those resources uh, in evacuating people or or, or uh, uh, taking them uh, from isolated areas, you do not have then the means to be able to continue the war against Al-Qaeda in which I must point out that Pakistan has been playing a very, very significant absolutely. role. We are the front and line. we thank you. We thank we, you for We are the you. absolute front line state that has lost the maximum number of people. And so, uh, you know, I'm sure that the, um, uh, that the floods affect the terrorists as much as the state, uh, but uh, the fact remains that the uh, loss to the state structure and to the mm -hmm. uh, rest of the population is far greater. And the fourth is the tensions that it breeds within and between countries and, and, and various actors in the region and, um, and between various sections of society. You have, uh, you have, uh, fewer, uh, you have uh, more people fighting over fewer resources. There's already tension between India and Pakistan for political reasons. Water becomes another issue between our countries. Uh, it is also a potential issue between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, management of, uh, of, of, of a disaster of this nature uh, would require uh, greater cooperation in the region and probably uh, on a wider scale. So all of those factors have security implications and to the extent that uh, the United States' own security is directly linked to security in our region, sure. it's, a, it's something that the American public and decision makers need to consider. If I may just um, take one part of what you just said and perhaps ask you to elaborate. I think I heard you say that the country has 50 helicopters uh, and that this flood has required a redeployment of those helicopters from other places that affect the security of Pakistan. Um, and, and absolutely, you had to do that. This is a human tragedy. You know, the whole world's hearts go out to Pakistan. But talk a little bit about the internal security of, of Pakistan in terms of moving those 50 helicopters from other places that uh, otherwise would be considered to be national security concerns for the country of Pakistan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know that uh, for the last two and a half, two and a half years, the Pakistani military has been engaged in counterinsurgency and counterterrorism operations in the northwest of the country. Uh, so basically, uh, any uh, uh, military assets such as helicopters that uh, are deployed for flood relief are taken away mm -hmm. from the counterinsurgency and counterterrorist operations. Um, 
um, and uh, and and uh, uh, to uh, to the extent that uh, most of the extremists and the terrorists are operating in mountainous regions which are not necessarily flooded, uh, the ability of the insurgents and the terrorists to be con able to continue to remain on the move while our own military cannot uh, uh, continue to be. Uh, uh, fully deployed in the sense of having the assets to be able to fight them, it strains our uh, ability to fight the extremists and terrorists uh, in the northwest of Pakistan along the Afghan border. And as a result, it, un it reduces your capacity to help the United States a in creating this pincer movement Absolutely on the sir. terrorists because you have to redeploy your military security over to uh, parts of Pakistan that are affected by the no, flood, and as a result, it has a dramatic impact on American security well, and because and Afghanistan is now at the very top of the list of American security concerns. Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, Pakistan-Afghan border, as you know, is a very long border, and the effort that the two sides have been making over the last two and a half years have been to create a hammer and anvil in which uh, the terrorists are not able to go into Afghanistan when the Pakistani army is moving against them on the Pakistani side, and they can't move into Pakistani territory when the U.S. and Afghan forces are moving against them on the Afghan side. It's not just Pakistani helicopters that have been diverted towards flood relief, it's also American helicopters. Mm -hmm. sir. So in that sense, I think that there is an impact on our security situation, and I'm not saying that uh, uh, that we would do anything else. That was the priority. Saving lives is the priority, exactly, and I think be. both of us have done right in doing that. But if we could somehow understand the bigger picture and 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 take steps that would ensure that the uh, that we could plan better uh, for uh, changes such as the uh, the massive floods that we had, um, or uh, figure out what causes them and try to deal with the causes we may be better off as, uh, uh, as human beings. Thank you. Well, my time has expired. Let me turn and recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, for as much time as he may consume. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, luckily for you, my committee responsibilities take me elsewhere, so I won't uh, be uh, 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 lengthy in my inquiry, but I, I, I appreciate uh, the context that's been established by the ambassador. Uh, one would think that the tragedy that's uh, occurred in Pakistan would be yet another wake-up call. But it seems that at times people here um, are not sensitive to what's happening halfway around the world, but maybe some things that are closer to home. So I would like to just follow up uh, very briefly with a, a couple of the comments from our uh, other witnesses. Uh, there was reference to extreme weather events, heat waves, for instance, that um, uh, I'm not certain people understand the impact that that has. We think of the thousands of deaths in Europe, for instance, problems in the Midwest uh, in the last decade. Uh, I'm curious if uh, uh, our witnesses could uh, elaborate a little bit by, by putting uh, some sense of what, the, what uh, the impact may be for these ever incre escalating high temperatures uh, and perhaps laying to rest the canard that, um, well, climate change might be good for agriculture because I'm hearing that we're talking about uh, ex extreme uh, rain uh, at the same time we're having uh, change in the moisture composition uh, of the soil, which sounds like it's bad for agriculture. So I, I wonder uh, if our witnesses could give a little, uh, briefly give some dimension to the seriousness of these uh, that people might be facing here in the United States that might get their attention if the events in Pakistan didn't. Well, Could you turn on your microphone? That's right. Yes? On. Okay. Sorry, it wasn't. Um, a really intense heat wave in this country say, parallel to the event that killed 40,000 people in Europe. Um, a really, it's a really extreme event, a once-in-a-thousand-year event a, a, in that case. Could become sort of a once-in-several-year event by the end of this century if the g emissions of the gases continue to build as they are. That is something that almost never happens, virtually unprecedented, maybe unprecedented, could become rather common in the future with the attendant consequences. So for instance, an extreme heat wave 
1995 in the Midwest killed over 1,000 people due to the direct and indirect effects of the heat. Uh, that was a relatively rare event, and people weren't prepared to deal with it. That kind of event might become, instead of a 100-year event, something like uh, several years. It would happen every several years. It would happen repeatedly. Will we be prepared to deal with that kind of onslaught? Will we learn more in the meantime? Probably. But as the climate changes, stranger and stranger events will become more and more common. As far as your question, agriculture is concerned, it's a mixed picture for the United States. If you look toward the more southerly and westerly and drier parts of the United States, one would expect the standard of cereal grains, for instance, to decrease, the productivity of those grains to decrease. Up to the north and more to, to the east or central part of the United States, the climate might actually become more favorable. So most of the analyses show a kind of balanced picture for the United States as a whole, with some regions losing and some regions maybe coming out somewhat ahead. Any other elaboration? But go ahead. Um, in my written testimony, I have, I have some numbers for this. Um, in the first figure, I, I show how frequent um, an event, that a heat wave, that we consider um, to be um, likely to happen once every 20 years. If uh, in a business as usual greenhouse gas emission scenario, um, that what we consider once in 20 years now would be every other year. And so hence that, that's the root of the rare event becoming commonplace. And so there certainly would see an ad adaptation of that. Um, if you have um, uh, two severe years in a row, the second time isn't as bad. You know, the people that were going to die the first time already did. Um, and it's as harsh as that, it's as harsh as that reality, I think. Um, but the rare events predicted at the end of the century under this scenario um, would be as much as 11 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than they would otherwise be. And so, um, that, that's a lot, and um, I'm not a human health expert, but I think it's fairly obvious that that, that could be very dangerous. Well, I guess uh, my concern is uh, maybe you kill off um, some of the weak and the vulnerable among us uh, with the first uh, event, um, when they come every other year, every third year. But what I also heard in your testimony is that the extremes are going to get worse, the temperatures get higher, when we're talking about uh, increases in the highest of 5 or 10 degrees Fahrenheit, it strikes me that that has dimensions that we uh, are going to have a great deal of difficulty contending with, like our, even our capacity to be able uh, to provide uh, cooling, for instance, uh, on an overstressed grid, or extreme weather events um, could interact in, in terms of uh, posing problems with actually the supply of uh, energy itself. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm still sort of processing this, but it uh, sounds to me unnerving in terms of uh, how this scales up in a way that we're not quite, uh, um, I think, uh, able to comprehend at this point. Um, I, I would add that one of the things that frightens me the most is that um, the projections um, are, are for such a level for the average, but the extremes are actually higher. And so we expect, I expect that the extreme heat wave will, will change at a greater rate than, um, than the average climate. Thank you. Um, in the report, we mentioned the global climate change impacts in the United States. We have a chapter on health, a chapter on energy, and a chapter on agriculture. And you're summing up some of the concerns quite well. That, for example, in the chapter on energy, we talk about how, how um, Thermal power plants, you know, coal burning power plants require a lot of water to cool them. And the times when you need the energy most is during the summer and particularly really hot, dry summers. And so there's been, been some uh, droughts in, in my part of the world in the southeast where there were some concerns that even some nuclear power plants might have to shut down because of the lack of cooling water potential acts. So there's all these interactions we have to take, take concern about. In f as far as heat waves and human health, we reported on studies showing you know dr potential dramatic increase in in heat wave deaths in cities like Chicago, and even with some adaptation going on, where there um, some of the adaptation aspects are cooling centers. There's an effort in Chicago that they're doing a great job in trying to to have cool roofs, painting roofs white, or planting um, um, putting plants on top of the roofs to help cool some of the centers. But there are 
there have been studies looking at the impact of heat waves, um, sort of an analog heat wave to the European heat wave, what it would impact the United States, and found that the impact is much more in cities that were not designed for that kind of temperature. So Washington, D.C. had less of a problem coping with really high temperatures than, say, New York City. And it's because the infrastructure in New York City was designed for the climate that they had when, they, when the city was being built, and it's now warmer and getting even warmer. Regarding agriculture, um, we clearly state in the report that agriculture is going to be challenged. There's going to be challenged due to heat waves impacting, impacting some of the livestock and you know, dairy industries. Where it's going to be challenged from the increase of heavy downpours and then the longer periods of, of dry periods. But even the question of CO2, which is known as a plant fertilizer, that, that isn't all rosy, that plants do tend to grow larger from CO2, but we make a point that they're not always more nutritious. And this is particularly too true of pasture plants, that uh, the grasses, they'll be, they'll be larger and they may grow larger in a higher CO2 environment, but the amount of nutrition does not increase proportionally, the amount of protein in the, in the plants. Thank you. Thank you. Again, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your questions. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador. Okay. Yes, Mr. Ambassador, we've been joined by Congressman Inslee from Washington State. Uh, Ambassador Haqqani has laid out the impacts on this country, Congressman, and, uh, uh, and the national security implications not only for Pakistan and, but for our country since they are helping us in our battle against al-Qaeda and terrorism. Uh, so I turn now to recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee, for as much time as he may consume. Thank you, and thanks individually for your great work standing up against this assault on science, which is trying, trying to basically ask us to forget the basic laws of thermodynamics. And so I appreciate you guys standing up and uh, against that assault. Um, I heard uh, someone, it might have been John Holdren or something, uh, use the term climate disruption. He basically said we should be using the term climate disruption rather than global warming as to what we really are facing. Is that a better term to use, listening to your description of the probabilities of increased frequency of these, is that a, a better term to use to convey what we're facing uh, to, to folks who may not have degrees in chemistry? Thank you, Mr. Inslee. Um, that is an excellent term to use, and part of it is because what, uh, what I've, the point I made is that the natural and human, human systems are adaptive to the past climate. When you change that, you get different responses. And one of the things we've seen in Alaska, for example, in the Kenai Peninsula, where the, um, the winter temperatures, the really cold, extreme cold winter temperatures have lessened and, and have warmed, allowing um, a greater number of the spruce beetles to overwinter, which has then just help devastate the whole um, the forest in that area. So it's very much not just a gradual shift, but a real disruption. Um, we have a figure in our report, Global Climate Change Impacts in the United States, showing moving states during the summer that, it, that the projection is using a high emission scenario that the summers in s southern Minnesota at the end of the century will be very similar to the current summers in northern Oklahoma. So if you think of the, about the disruption that, that would cause, that you know, there's different plants grow, growing along the river system, different animals, farmers grow different crops, you build houses differently, you lay railroad tracks differently to adjust for it. So, so that can have a lot of disruption on the whole systems. Thank you. Uh, let, let me add that um, the question of disruption really gets to the, the, root, uh, the root issue, which is how will we be able to respond as a society and as individuals as the climate inevitably does change, because we're going to get climate change, more climate change no matter what, um, although we can limit its extent eventually. So really this gets to uh, an issue which has been hanging around for a long time. It used to be argued, and it had some traction in the expert community that, uh, that I'm in, that the, a rich country like the U.S. could deal with these changes, and it was really less well-off countries like Pakistan that were going to have the trouble. But the recent, in recent years, there were two outstanding events, and a, a point again to Hurricane Katrina, which may have had nothing to do with global warming, but it's, a, it's an extreme that we got a good lesson on, and the European heat wave, which taught us that even in rich countries, 
which are supposed to have the resources and the experience to deal with the vagaries of climate, the disruptions that climate some, sometimes accompany climate events, we were incapable, even in a situation like with Katrina, where we anticipated what would happen, even where we had a previous example from a, a hurricane in 1965, I think. So my view has, is, and my colleagues' view has come around to thinking that the U.S. is very vulnerable, perhaps in some ways more vulnerable because of our uh, built inf infrastructure, for instance, along the coast. And, our and the demonstrated limits, no matter how wealthy we are, no matter how much we look forward, our demonstrated limits to incorporate that knowledge and turn it into implementation of ways to defend ourselves from the coming climate changes. Um, just, um, I've got a two-year-old grandson who is going to be living in a very different world, I think, than, than I grew up in. And some of the things I enjoyed, which is salmon in the rivers, snow in the mountains in the state of Washington, I think aren't going to be there in a hundred years during his lifetime. Um, I, I just want to ask you, and yet there are people, many people in our country who do not feel compelled to say we should do something about this or even recognize there's a problem. And given the extent of the science on this, that's very difficult for me to understand, given how clear the science is in this regard. Could you just tell us, each of you, if you were to run into someone at a party and they said, you know, I was listening to one of my favorite TV channels and one of my favorite talkathon people, and they said this is just kind of a plot, that this is not really science, uh, and I don't believe that there's global warming or global disruption as a result of human activities. And you had, you know, 60 seconds with them. What would you tell that person? <laughs> yeah, what, what's your best shot? What is the most compelling thing to a person like that who so far hasn't been willing to listen to the science? Well, um, a good friend of mine used to say when somebody would ask him whether he believed in global warming, he said, I believe in quantum physics. <laughs> 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 that the physics are clear. But in response to some of this concern that, that people are trying to find nits to pick, um, in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society in, in July, we published a large article, The Climate of 2009. In it, we had a special little section, um, lead authored by John Kennedy of the UK Met Office, and I was a colleague on, on that process, which looked at all the different time series for like 11 different indicators. You know tropospheric temperature, the temperature of the atmosphere, temperature at the surface, uh, ocean temperature, ocean heat content, um, sea, Arctic sea ice, glaciers, sea ice, and every single time series of every one of those 11 indicators supported the global warming. Every single one. I mean, it, it's, it's sometimes just remarkable that people can, can see this evidence and, and uh, have kind of contrary views. Um, I as far as people who think it's a plot, I get emails every day, basically, which range from uh, uh, conspiratorial to threatening, um, trying to, you know, which accuse me and my colleagues of sort of making this up for uh, our own benefit, which is hard to imagine. I have young kids, too, and I can't imagine wanting to think about, you know, for them the same way you do, what the benefit of living in that sort of world would be. And so I think people who think it's a plot I, I think there's a limit to what you can deal with. But for most people, I, don't th I think it's a real concern about the uncertainties. There are big uncertainties in climate change, and we face an uncertain future because we can't predict everything, you know, uh, nail it down perfectly. And what I say to those people is that it, we are, as in a, using a metaphor that's been used many times, as if we're in a car driving at night with our lights off towards a cliff, uh, and do we have a, cha a choice of stepping on the accelerator or slowing down, stepping on the brakes, giving us a chance to learn more and giving us a chance to avoid some of the worst risks? And a sane person makes the latter choice, of course. I don't know how else to say it because the reality is people are overwhelmed with a lot of other stuff in their lives. It's easy to push off a problem, the worst effects of which may happen later. Uh, but I think if we try to frame it as, well, you make risk decisions every day in your life. You buy insurance against a fire that will probably never take down your house. This is a similar situation. I've been asked that very question by um, 
by another parent at my my daughter's school, and um, and um, <laughs> my first response was, to her, I said, well, why would I make this stuff up? And um, I don't think that convinced her. <laughs> um, and and I would agree with with Dr. Peterson in that the compelling evidence is 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 uh, that we look at so many different things and there's a consistent story here. But I but I also might appeal to the second part, the first part of this committee's name, which is energy independence. Um, it's not just about global warming. Um, the nation has other um, uh, compelling um, problems. One of which is is its reliance on um, on foreign sources of energy, and so um, uh, it's 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 not an either or. Can I close with one comment in that regard? In 2000, there were five major solar manufacturing companies in the United States, and there were five in China. That was in 2000. In 2009, there are still five major solar manufacturing companies in the United States, and there are 528 in China. I appreciate your work. Thank you. I, I thank the gentleman very much. And uh, um, um, we're going to go right from made by OPEC to made in China. We're never going to have a made in the U.S. solar, wind, renewable energy industry. We're just going to skip it by having the people who don't believe in global warming, or even actually in putting together a domestic new technology um, uh, economy that ultimately we could export to other countries. You know, wouldn't Pakistan, wouldn't India love us to develop? photovoltaics at the same cost as coal that could be deployed in the most remote villages almost instantaneously once it was the same cost as coal without building that whole infrastructure. And that's, I think, what the rest of the world thinks that we want to do at MIT and Caltech and hundreds of other universities, but we still haven't put in place the plan to accomplish that. Mr. Ambassador, let me ask you this question. One of the things that happened uh, after the floods was that India said to Pakistan, can we help you? Um, and, uh, and I think that's an interesting development to the world, huh? that India reached out. Uh, because this question of water and the impact on, on both countries is quite common huh? between the two countries. You share the Himalayas, you share the same water systems. Could you talk a little bit about that, about what happened here with India, and whether or not it actually is the beginning of the basis for cooperation between the two countries? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, hope that it is. Uh, Pakistan and most people in Pakistan uh, would like nothing better uh, than to overcome the difficulties that we have had uh, with India. And I am sure that that is the sentiment in India as well. Uh, y people, of course, often want uh, much more than uh, uh, politicians and leaders are sometimes willing to concede. Um, but uh, uh, this was uh, an act that was appreciated in Pakistan. Uh, the uh, the assistance that came from India through the United Nations uh, became part of a, uh, a bigger pool of uh, resources that were made available uh, to the <coughs> flood affectees. Uh, there is an ongoing process between India and Pakistan. Of course, there are difficulties as well. We still have unresolved issues such as the problem in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, but it is something that we will continue to talk about. And here, if you will allow me, I will link uh, my answer to your question to the question uh, that Mr. Inslee asked uh, the uh, representatives of the scientific community. Um, sometimes uh, it takes a while for people to accept uh, inconvenient truths. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not a grandfather yet, but uh, I'm old enough to uh, remember the time when people used to refuse to accept the science on the impact of uh, smoking. Uh, um, and, uh, and, there and, and I have lost friends uh, to smoking who just wouldn't believe the science on it. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, just as there is this science about uh, mm. uh, 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 climate disruption, uh, there is also a reality that countries uh, in, in the South Asian region are very interdependent. Mm -hmm. Our prosperity depends on each other, our security depends on each other, uh, even our water uh, uh, supplies depend on each other, and we eventually have to find a way of working things out and moving towards a future in which we put uh, the arguments uh, behind the needs that we share. No, and I, I thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I lost my father to lung cancer to smoking. 
And yet the Surgeon General in the United States issued the warning in 1966, but he didn't want to believe it. And as long as the American Tobacco Institute was financing science that said, well, there are still questions as to whether or not, he was more than willing to keep smoking because it's an addiction. You don't want to die. And the same thing happens here in global warming. While the overwhelming consensus of the leading scientists in the world, 98 percent, say there is a problem here, we should start to put in place the kinds of policies that will deal with the worst consequences of it. There are still scientists being funded by the fossil fuel industry to raise enough questions that we still have a debate here uh, as to whether or not there is a problem, when I think there is incontrovertible evidence that there is, and Pakistan is a good um, example of what is happening. And there will be innocent victims, you know, my father and millions of others um, across the planet. Uh, to the bad science of tobacco, uh, and there will be here as well, unfortunately. What I'm wondering is from our expert witnesses, are there any questions of the ambassador about Pakistan or about what they're doing that any of you might have uh, for him that uh, he might be able to uh, answer for you at this time? Dr. Oppenheimer. Yes, I'd just like to know, um, you know Pakistan, this uh, heavy monsoon event isn't unprecedented. It does happen. Um, was the difference this time that the precipitation event itself was more severe, or had there been changes in the way Pakistan manages its water system, or it just there have been population increases in certain areas? Yeah, well, uh, basically, the traditional pattern of flooding in the Indus uh, River Basin has always been that the eastern tributaries of the Indus uh, used to be the ones that got flooded. Uh, this time, it was a totally different pattern, uh, something that has not been on record which is that the floods were caused primarily through uh, r heavy rains in the northwest. As I said, it's 10 years of rain in one week, totally, totally sort of, you know, uh, uh, out of the blue. Pakistan's meteorolo meteorological assets are also primarily deployed on the assumption that we are dealing with uh, sort of precipitation patterns which occur on the n in, the in the northeast. And so when this happened, we just didn't have enough on ground uh, sort of uh, uh, flood management assets, or for that matter, uh, even the basic infrastructure to be able to uh, uh, predict the patterns. And so the primary flooding was caused by the rise in water levels in the western tributaries of the Indus, which have historically never flooded. And in an area where such rains have never taken place, the monsoons have always hit the northeast and not the northwest. Doctor? I have a question I should probably know the answer to, but I don't, and so I'm going to afford this opportunity to ask it. Um, how much is Pakistan dependent on, um, on snow melt from the Himalayas for, for water, or is it all monsoon? I uh, will not be able to give you a, a, a scientific and accurate answer. I'm being a diplomat, I'm not always uh, up to date on, on numbers like that, but my understanding is that uh, a significant uh, part of our uh, uh, sort of water flows comes from snow melt, and the monsoons are only a uh, uh, only part. And I have a number here. Just give me a second, and I'll find it for you. Um, yes, uh, we actually uh, depend on about 154 million acre feet of water from snow melt. So that is basically uh, more than half uh, of the uh, of the waters that come through our rivers are essentially snow melt and not uh, uh, monsoon dependent. The reason I ask is that this means that, that, um, that we share a common problem. Um, in the western United States, most of the water supply comes from snow melt. And as the climate warms, um, the timing and pattern of that melt will, um, will change. And the systems that, that are in place to uh, distribute the water will be inadequate. And so in that sense, we, 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 we share a common problem had a disruption in the snow melt patterns in the last few years. That is something that our scientists are studying as to how much of it is because of uh, unprecedented human activity in the glaciers, um, uh, the, the, the warming factor, uh, and all of that is under study because we've had a couple of years in which the snow melt patterns have been uh, sort of uh, totally in the opposite direction. So it's something that is that requires more study. And our uh, and we are and and it's one of the subjects that uh, 
climatologists in India and Pakistan are studying together. Now, the ambassador has to leave, and here's what I would ask then before you leave, Mr. Ambassador, if you would indulge us. Uh, I would like to conclude the hearing by having each one of our witnesses give us the one minute that you want us to remember out of this hearing, and Mr. Inslee's already asked a similar question, but and then wind up with the ambassador, you know, making his a final uh, presentation uh, to us, uh, and uh, that your testimony has been invaluable today. By the way, there's been no other hearing like this on Capitol Hill since the beginning of the Pakistani floods. I mean, the ambassador comes up to talk to individual members, but I think that's why we have the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming, so we can have the public discussions uh, and briefings that are televised and that uh, can be seen and heard and reported upon across the country. That's why we have the Select Committee. Uh, doctor, if we could begin with you. What I bring, what I'm going to bring. If you hold for just 10 seconds. Thank you. Please, Doctor. What I'm personally going to bring home most from this are the images of of um, the suffering in Pakistan. Um, scientists often are locked in our offices, and we, um, you know, tend to be theoretical. And um, those images are um, astonishing, painful, and um, and bring a reality to my work that um, that I didn't appreciate before I got here. And I, I thank you for that, and and my condolences to the, the people of Pakistan. Dr. Peterson. Thank you, Chairman Markey. Um, in your opening remarks and in the, the Pakistani ambassador's remarks, you talked about some real-world examples of extremes. And one of the, the points that I bring is we measure extremes somewhat differently when we're dealing with, with strictly daily data. But throughout the world, we're seeing the changes in extremes the way we've um, scientists have been projecting based on global warming. Dr. Oppenheim. And I would just add that uh, we have here a, um, a consensus, and it's a consensus that reflects the thinking of the scientific community, that the climate has already changed, that extremes are, have already changed, and that they're going to change more in the future, that they obviously have vast and, in some cases, devastating human impacts. And the only way to rein this in, in addition to getting better at our anticipation of the extremes, which is difficult in a changing climate, after all, is to limit the changes in emissions that are causing the extremes to change. Thank you, Dr. Oppenheimer. Let me turn to Congressman Inslee. Thank you. I just wanted to alert the committee to something. Um, yesterday, a coalition of leading climate scientists in the United States filed a 48-page document uh, with Congress refuting uh, assertions by uh, Christopher Moncton, who appeared in front of our committee at the re request of the Republican Party some time ago, who basically asserted that there was no scientific basis for this. And I just want to alert the committee to this, uh, because that report included responses by 21 prominent client scientists who reviewed the claims by Mr. Moncton uh, and concluded that his assertions were either variously, very misleading, profoundly wrong, simply false, chemical nonsense, and cannot be supported by climate physics. And I want to laud those scientists for getting engaged on what is clearly a war on science, because we have special interests who are financing a war on science right now. And I want to, I want to uh, thank the scientific community who is starting to understand this is a war on science. And we need scientists to respond to that war, frankly. And this document that's been filed is helpful in that regard. Uh, you know, this was an individual who, whose primary um, uh, uh, scientific credibility was that he asserted that he was a lord. And we are more appreciative of scientists. So I want to thank anybody in the scientific community who's willing to share their information with the public, and we'll make uh, part that report part of this record, I, if we can offer that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, unlike Lord Moncton, uh, Mr. Inzi and I, we, we believe in quantum physics. Okay, so <laughs> that's, our, that's our core belief in, uh, in the, this area. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, it has been an honor for us to have you here with us. If you could give us your concluding comments. 
My concluding comment, sir, uh, is that for the 20 million people who have been affected by these floods, uh, the impact of climate disruption is real. For the father who's lost his child, uh, or for the mother who's looking for the child who's been swept into a totally different village or town, uh, this is something uh, that is very real uh, and very different from the academic arguments and sometimes the uh, sort of uh, uh, loud political talk radio arguments that I hear in this country. I would just say that people need to pay attention to what it means for people rather than what it is in terms of winning or losing their argument. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, very much. The flooding disaster in Pakistan is a warning of what lies ahead if we do not cut carbon pollution from heavy downpours and flooding to more intense heat waves and tropical storms. Extreme weather juiced up by climate change is becoming a greater threat. Yet there are in America powerful forces with an interest in maintaining the status quo, trying to prevent us from taking action. In fact, as we speak today, two Texas-based oil refiners, Valero and Tessero, and the oil and gas billionaires and global warming deniers Charles and David Koch are bankrolling the effort to overturn California's Global Warming Solutions Act. That might work for the bank accounts of oil tycoons, but it sends the rest of us on a path towards greater extreme weather, instability, and suffering at a global scale. We need to protect California's forward thinking, and on a national scale, we need to put in place the policies that will drive a new energy economy towards a clean, prosperous, and secure future. That is what the Waxman-Markey bill did as it passed the House of Representatives June 26, 2009. And that is what the citizens of the United States and the world deserve, that the United States is the leader in developing the new technologies. Uh, we thank the participants for, uh, the, for delivering their important messages here today, for conveying the plight of the people of Pakistan to us. It touches our hearts, our consciences, and hopefully our political responsibility here in the United States to not only give short-term relief to your country, uh, but to create a long-term uh, program uh, that will reduce the likelihood that even more catastrophic events are in the future. Uh, we have to begin the process of cutting carbon now to avoid those even greater dangers that the planet will suffer from. So with that, we uh, very much thank all of you for your participation, uh, and this briefing is concluded. Got that, everybody listening? You're going to hear FIMSA for the next hour or so. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, uh, Administrator for Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, FIMSA. Prior to her nomination, Ms. Quarterman was a partner in the law firm of Steptoe and Johnson and a member of the Obama Administration Transition Team at the Department of Energy. We welcome you, Administrator Quarterman. Whenever you feel ready, please begin. Thank you. Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today and discuss the oversight responsibilities of the United States Department of Transportation's Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration and the Obama Administration's legislative proposal for the Department's Pipeline Safety Program. Before I discuss these topics, I would like to extend my sincere condolences to the families of all of those whose lives were forever changed by the September 9th Pacific Gas and Electric Pipeline failure in San Bruno, California. Last week, I joined FEMSA investigators on the scene in San Bruno supporting the efforts of the NTSB and the California Public Utility Commission. I saw firsthand the devastating impact this incident is having on that community. Incidents such as this and the recent oil pipeline failure in Marshall, Michigan 
must not happen. As the sole federal agency with regulatory oversight for the safety of pipelines, we must do our part to keep communities free of risk and exposure to pipeline failures and enhance public confidence in the safety of the nation's energy pipelines. To ensure safety is not to, to ensure safety is not only the department's top priority, but also the top priority of those we regulate. Secretary LaHood unveiled a legislative proposal last week that would strengthen the department's regulatory oversight capabilities for pipelines. The proposal is designed to hold all operators accountable for operating their pipelines in a safe and environmentally sound manner. Among other things, the proposal would raise the maximum penalty for the most serious violations from $1 million to $2.5 million. It would authorize 40 additional federal inspection and